Uh, today, we want to finish up with Ezekiel. I'm starting in chapter 20, and uh, I, I really gave very short shrift to the latter part of uh, chapters 18 and 19. I, I mentioned the, the four literary genres uh, that Ezekiel uh, uses, the uh, allegory, fable, parable, and lamentation. And I've kind of left you to work out that a little bit on your own, but you do have the PowerPoint. You can look at that as well. And there's a couple of areas today that I'll be doing fairly lightly because there's some areas I want to be sure I don't miss. Um, and there's just, you know, there's just so many things you can crowd into a certain length of time. So uh, to some degree, you have to be a little bit selective. Um, but we are ready to roll. And uh, as we come to chapter 20, the elders of the community in exile have come to Ezekiel to seek his counsel. Um, probably uh, they're hoping he has some uh, encouraging word for them. Uh, and uh, he doesn't really. Uh, but in his uh, response to them, he is going to trace the history of rebellion going all the way back to the time of the Exodus when God brought them out of Egypt and gave, gave them the land of Canaan and, and show them that what is happening now uh, in the 6th century is very much the same that was happening back then, uh, all the way back to the time of Egypt. So the historical case against Israel began in Egypt. God made his covenant with them, but his covenant was that they must forsake the idols of Egypt. Instead, they clung to those idols, which we see epitomized in the golden calf uh, that Aaron constructed. Uh, and the only reason God did not destroy them way back then was in order to protect his name. Now, <clears throat> I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about this idea of his name because that's such a central feature in chapter 20, this idea of the name of Yahweh which is really a way of talking about his reputation for compassion and forgiveness. God doesn't destroy them, not because they don't deserve it, but because he is compassionate, because he is long-suffering. Um, so when you come to this term name, the, the, the word name in Hebrew, this is a synecdoche for personality, character, and reputation. I'm not sure if you're familiar with the word synecdoche. This is a, an English word or a poetic uh, uh, form in which the part of something represents the whole. Oh, they do. Well, I'm impressed. So they have metonymy, too? Oh, and alliteration, all those kind of things? Oh, cool, very cool. All right. All right, I am impressed. I am impressed, yes. Okay. I, I surely am impressed. <laughs> I'm not just saying that. Um, not that I would just say that. Uh, in any case, in the ancient Near East, your name embodied the essence of your essential character, your personhood. This was very much the way that the ancient Near Eastern people thought about names. Sometimes you wonder how people actually got their names or how, um, how their parents may have given them their names because they seem a little bit odd, but often they do embody something. Probably the very first example is the name Adam. Uh, in the book of Genesis. Adam is related to the Hebrew word uh, for dirt, which is Adama. I know some of you think that men are dirt anyway. Uh, but uh, a, a good translation, actually, of, uh, of God creating Adam out of the dust of the earth is out of clods of dirt. Um, and uh, that may not be entirely inappropriate for some of us. We're clods once in a while. Uh, but Adam's name, Adam, is a play on this idea of Adama, uh, that he is a dirt creature, he's a soil creature. He is made out of the dirt of the earth. Uh, Naval, this happens in the time of David, is a name that means fool. And you may remember that there's this passage that said he is very well named. Because he was a fool. <laughs> now, I can't imagine parents having a child and deciding to name him Fool. Um, I'm not sure how that came about, uh, but in any case, uh, his name uh, typified his character. Uh, Elijah, similar. Uh, we talked yesterday about the, the A-H ending, the Yah ending, uh, and Elijah's name means Yahweh is my God. 
Eli, El, being God, the I being the first person singular pronominal suffix, and Yah being the short form of Yahweh, Yahweh is my God. In fact, when the people on Mount Carmel, you remember after the fire fell on the altar that Elijah built when they said uh, uh, Yahweh is God, they're essentially saying Elijah's name. Yahweh is God. Uh, Yahweh is my God. Um, names in the book of Ruth are very important. Uh, you've done the book of Ruth, right? And you probably went through those names. Elimelech, uh, his name means my uh, God is the king. Uh, Naomi, whose name means pleasant, but she changes her name to bitter or Mara. Uh, there is Kilion and Malon, her sons, whose names respectively mean sickness and disease. So you're not too surprised when they die pretty early. Uh, and then there's Orpa, whose name means back of the neck. She's the one who turned away from Naomi and went back. And then there's Ruth, whose name is friend. I mean, all of those names are, are just, they carry the storyline all the way through the actual book. So <clears throat> when we talk about the name of Yahweh, we are talking about a name that captures his reputation for compassion and forgiveness. Yes. That is one of the surprising things. And you wonder whether, uh, it almost seems like it would be, they would get this name a little later in life after they've kind of established their pattern. You know? I, I don't actually know. I mean, it seems to be that the, the parents give the child's name. But the names are almost, in a sense, prophetic. Uh, they, they capture something about the essence of that person uh, that will later become evident in their life. Uh, yeah. Uh, well, that's a good question. Uh, that would not be the case for Elijah. Those, those names, uh, yeah, uh, Naval, yeah, Naval, we, you, you could see how that might come later <laughs> after he did some really dumb things. <laughs> uh, so I, I don't know. Um, uh, in some cases we know that can't be the case. Maybe in some cases it could be the case. Uh, so uh, we don't know. Actually, we don't know enough about the, the uh, development of the Hebrew language to probably answer that kind of question. About two years ago, they discovered an inscription in the Valley of Allah, the Allah inscription it's called, which is arguably the earliest inscription in Hebrew that we have to date on any kind of, uh, of writing material. Uh, and it only is going to date back to somewhere around the 11th century BC. Uh, Hebrew, like most languages, is a developed language. Uh, if you go back far enough, you find that there were some letters in the alphabet that disappeared. Um, they had more than 22 letters at one point, and then they kind of formalized or standardized. In fact, in the early days, very early inscriptions, Hebrew was not always written as it is written now. Uh, sometimes it is written uh, right to left, which is the way we typically would read Hebrew. There are inscriptions where it's written top to bottom. And uh, actually a few where they're written left to right, and a few where they're written this way in this line, and this way in this line, and this way in this line. So it's, it's called as the ox plows. You kind of read this way, you know. Um, so there's, there's, a, there's quite a bit of uh, linguistic development going on. Uh, the alphabet itself is not standardized to somewhere around the 14th century uh, BC, and then there were still some developments. There were script developments. So there's a lot of things we know about Hebrew in, in kind of a general way, but very specific issues like whether a name could have, a, could have its meaning come later than the actual word. Uh, I'm not sure we can really figure that out. Yeah. Yeah. The 
Yes, often that's the case, yes. <laughs> yeah. Well, this was very true in the ancient Near East. It's, it's true of some cultures today. Now, Westerners usually choose names for reasons because like, they like the way it sounds or something like that, you know, which is really, doesn't really mean anything. But many cultures today, as, as you mentioned, choose names more deliberately uh, because of what they mean. And that was certainly true in the ancient Near East. And that was very true of God's name. When God says he is protecting his name, he is acting in Israel, for Israel, or even against Israel with respect to his name, it's capturing this idea that his name embodies who he is. It embodies, it embodies his personhood. This is the earliest inscription we have, one of the earliest inscriptions we have of the divine name on record. This is a little uh, silver roll which is from about the 600s BC, so about the time of Ezekiel. Uh, this little silver roll is very difficult to unroll this, but it does have Hebrew, ancient Hebrew script on it, and in there it has the priestly blessing. Uh, may Yahweh bless you, may Yahweh keep you, may Yahweh make his face to shine upon you, and so on. Uh, this is one of the very earliest actual written texts that has the name of Yahweh. By the time that you get to the time of Jesus, approximately, the Israelites have begun uh, not verbally pronouncing the name of Yahweh, largely because of this text in Ezekiel 20 that says they profaned his name when they went, went into, before they went into exile. And so in order to not profane his name, they quit saying it. So when you read the word Yahweh, in the Hebrew Bible, if you're in a synagogue service and they come to the name Yahweh, they will not say Yahweh. They will say Adonai. And the verbal uh, vowel pointing uh, under Yahweh is actually corresponding to the name Adonai, which is a clue to the reader that he's not supposed to say that. In the Dead Sea Scrolls, for instance, uh, in the great Isaiah scroll, uh, they simply, when they come to the name Yahweh in a number of places, they don't even write it out. See, Yahweh would be written like this, but instead of Yahweh, four letters, they just have four dots in the Dead Sea Scrolls text. And this is from a, a pro probably a bit earlier than the time of Jesus. So when you come to the four dots, you know that's the tetragrammaton or the four-letter name of Yahweh, and you are clued in that you're not supposed to read that. <clears throat> so anyway, this all relates, uh, at least in a general way, to Ezekiel 20 and this idea that God's name is to be honored and protected, and the people, by their behaviors and their covenant violation, have profaned his name and therefore will go into exile. And so, as he says in verse 25, he gave them over to statutes that were not good. Now, in verse 25, I'd like you to notice something in your NRSV, where it says, moreover, I gave them statutes that were not good. Personally, I think the NIV has a better translation of this, and I'm going to go with it. Um, and since you don't read Hebrew, you'll have to take my word for it, uh, unless you do read Hebrew. Uh, but I think that the language here is not just that he gave it to them, but he gave them over to these statutes. That's a really an important language issue because 
It's the language that St. Paul is going to borrow in the New Testament in the book of Romans when he says God gave them over to do certain things that were destructive. He draws that language from this passage in Ezekiel. So the language that begins in Ezekiel with respect to Israelites that God gave them over to follow statutes uh, which they would violate and, and show by their waywardness that they were covenant violators, Paul uses this to show the depravity of the whole human race who God has given over to disobedience. I'm going to come back to that idea about giving them over to this in a, in a moment, uh, and we're going to discuss something there. But for right now, uh, <clears throat> just to go on in the passage, uh, he asks the question, will you defile yourselves the way your fathers did? And what he's intending is that they make a parallel between what happened back in the wilderness after they came out of Egypt and what is happening now in the land of Judah. Ancient Israel in the time of Moses is parallel to Israel in the time of Ezekiel. So Kadesh, which is where they rebelled against God, uh, what happens at Kadesh? This is back in the book of Numbers, actually. Uh, the fuller name is Kadesh Barnea. What, what did they do there? What were they supposed to do there? They were supposed to take the land, send in the spies. The spies came back. Uh, ten of the spies had a, had a discouraging report, and so the whole nation decided we're not going in. God considered that to be outright rebellion. That was absolutely a confrontation, a rebellion against what God told them to do. And so he said, well, okay, we'll all die. And they said, well, maybe we will go in after all. Um, but, of course, that was too late. Uh, but Kadesh becomes sort of a symbol of confrontational rebellion against God. And this, of course, is what's happening in the kingdom of Judah in the time of Ezekiel and Jeremiah. The rebellion is to re refuse to serve God alone. In the ancient uh, story, they were then sentenced to the next 40 years in the desert until all of those generations 20 years older, in that generation 20 years and older, died. Uh, which is a, I don't know if you've ever thought about it, but you know, if you're, if you're living and camping for years and years in the desert and waiting for only one thing, all of these people to die, at some point there's going to be just one guy left. How would you like to have been that guy? The whole community of Israel waiting for just you to die. Would you hurry up and kick off so we can get on with the purpose of God here? <laughs> Uh, talk about a complex. <laughs> um, <clears throat> in any case, <clears throat> now they are going into the desert again, or the wilderness again. But it's not the wilderness of Sinai. It is the wilderness of Babylon, the wilderness of exile. The death of the first generation of Israelites in the desert of Sinai is the first time you run into this idea of a remnant that is left over to survive and carry on the line of the nation. So <clears throat> when you get the sentence of death at Kadesh, everyone 20 years and older is going to die before you can go into the land. Suddenly you have this idea that the promises are to be fulfilled to someone left over, a remnant. Now the word remnant is not used in the book of Numbers in the way that it's going to be used in the prophets and later. But the prophets are going to take this idea of a part left over and attach to it a particular word that's going to be a critical word, and this is the word remnant. Uh, Amos is the one who, who really starts this by talking about Israel will be uh, a savagely attacked by a wild beast, and there's not going to be hardly anything left but a piece of an ear and you know, just some shreds uh, of this animal. Uh, the remnant that's left. And then as you work your way through the prophets, particularly by the time you get to the post-exilic prophets of Zechariah and Haggai, the word remnant then is going to figure very significantly as the piece that is left over that will carry on the promises of God to a future generation. So <clears throat> the death of the first generation in, in the Sinai Desert parallels the death of the idolaters in Nebuchadnezzar's siege of Jerusalem. The second generation in the desert of Sinai parallels the remnant that is left over after Nebuchadnezzar has destroyed Jerusalem. And in all of this process, Yahweh upholds his name. 
He upholds his character of faithfulness, his character of truthfulness, even his character of compassion and long-suffering. The remnant, then, are the ones who bear the existence of the community. And, as I mentioned, it starts at Kadesh, but you continue to find this idea coming more and more uh, to the front as you work your way through the prophets. As you get to the end of chapter 20 and move into chapter 21, there is the vision of the sword of judgment, uh, which has some precedence in the book, but now is going to be explained in some particular ways. I'm not going to spend very much time with this. I don't think it's very difficult, uh, except that there's one part I probably should say a little bit about, and that is this third strophe in which Yahweh sovereignly controls this omen against the land of Judah. So I do want to go to that one in which the army of Nebuchadnezzar, pardon me, oh, strophe is a, is a poetic term for a stanza. Okay, if you think stanza, strophe, those are the same, essentially. Okay, yeah, I'm sorry. I, I should have used stanza, maybe. Uh, but anyway, I don't always think about when I'm writing about who's listening. So, <laughs> so whether, whether I'm using the right vocabulary or not, you know. Um, <clears throat> anyway, there is uh, down the Transjordan, there is uh, a path, if you want to call it that, that was used many times in the ancient world by armies. You can't, you can't take an army just on any road. Um, and you certainly can't take an army right down here through the center of the mountains of Israel because all of the valleys run east-west. It's like, it's like just, it would be horrendous to try and take an army through there. So generally, if you're taking an army from somewhere up here to, say, Egypt, which often happened, you went one of two ways. You went across over here, came over to the, the, uh, the Jezreel Valley and came down the coastline, which is relatively flat, and that is called the Way of the Sea, the Via Mera. Or you came down the Transjordan on the east side of Jordan, which was called the King's Highway. Now, uh, the term, the Highway of the Kings, is actually a biblical phrase, but it is a phrase in the ancient Near East to describe the way that armies often move. So when Nebuchadnezzar is coming to invade, he's not coming down this way, He's coming down the Transjordan. But once he gets down here near the Jericho Fords, and there's only about three places in the Jordan Rift where you can ford the river with an army, uh, when he gets down here near the Jericho Fords, which is one of those three places, he's got to make a decision. Because he's going to destroy not only Jerusalem, he's going to destroy some other people as well. He's on, he's on the march. So when he gets here, he's got to decide, am I going to go to Rabbah or am I going to go to Jerusalem? And so he does some magic omens. And that's what this text is about. He's doing magic omens in which he's going to examine a liver and he's going to examine some arrows. Uh, Bellomancy, uh, and, uh, uh, Bellomancy is basically taking arrows uh, and throwing them and you see which way they point when they land. Okay? Uh, uh, the other... Babylonian liver divination is examining an animal who's been cut open and looking at their liver. Now, <clears throat> when you were in the British Museum a few weeks ago, did you manage to talk about this liver thing? Okay, good. So you're familiar with this. This is a clay model of an animal liver. Actually, you know, it kind of looks like a liver, I suppose. I'm not a physician, so I'm not sure. I'm not a vet either. Anyway, this clay uh, model has all these holes. Uh, in it, and you put little pegs in the holes uh, to match what you see in the liver from the living creature. Okay, so you, you line up this, and then you put the, 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 the real liver over here, and you try to make a comparison, and by uh, magic, you're supposed to be able to discern certain things about the future. So <clears throat> that's what this third strophe is about. Nebuchadnezzar is coming south. He's got to decide, am I going to go to Amman, uh, Amman for Rabbah, or am I going to go to Judah for Jerusalem, and in this case, the liver is going to tell him to go to Jerusalem. Uh, and Ezekiel predicts that he's headed for Jerusalem first to destroy it. So uh, does that, that kind of make sense, what it, what's happening there with the liver issue? Okay. <clears throat> um, when you get to chapter 22 of Ezekiel, you have more images of sin and judgment. Uh, particularly, Jerusalem is going to be called the city of bloodshed or the city of blood. 
And there are a number of ways in which he's going to describe that they are the city of blood. Uh, I won't go through all of them, uh, but he's going to, to describe them, particularly from the standpoint that blood is, by definition in the Torah, a contaminant that makes you unclean and unfit to approach God. So uh, if you, for instance, uh, have a hemorrhage, you can't approach God. Uh, if you have, uh, have had some other kind of thing about blood, you can't approach God. In fact, there are certain kinds of vocations which are particularly distasteful to Jewish people. Uh, can you think of a vocation that would be distasteful because of the, the contact with blood? A butcher, yeah. Butchers are not high on the list of acceptable uh, um, Occupations. I mean, obviously, somebody's got to do this, but you, you hope it's not you. Uh, okay, that sort of thing. And so, being a city of blood is, is, is related to bloodshed, but it's also related to blood as a contaminant. A blood, uh, blood being uh, 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 something that will make you unclean uh, and unfit to approach God. <clears throat> Jerusalem is also like a smelter filled with slag. Um, this would be uh, the melting of metals and skimming off the dross, uh, the base products off of the top uh, to make the metal more pure. Uh, Jerusalem is like that, is going to be cooked. And then Judah is also like a spiritual wasteland. He uses several metaphors here to describe, uh, to describe Judah. And then finally in chapter 23, he has this, speaking of stories, he has this story about the two sisters. Ahola and Aholaba. You do need to note that in Hebrew there is a play on words here because the word ohel, or ohel uh, in, in Hebrew is the word for tent. And the names Ahola and Aholaba are names that are based on the idea of tent. And the tent here is a tent of prostitution. Uh, this isn't camping with the Boy Scouts. This is uh, more ominous than that, okay? Um, and both of these sisters represent the northern nation and the southern nation, both of which were uh, involved in spiritual adultery by their idolatry uh, and mixing with the Canaanite fertility cult. Actually, it's kind of an irony, I guess, but not only is it spiritual adultery, it is actual adultery too, uh, because it, it involves uh, sexual promiscuity and uh, sacred prostitution, all of those kinds of things. So Ahola represents Samaria, which is the capital of the north. And she prostitutes herself to Assyria. And so Yahweh sends her into Assyria in exile and judgment. Aholava represents Jerusalem, who has prostituted herself to Assyria, and then Babylon, and then Egypt. And so God is going to send her to Babylon uh, in exile as well. This begins all the way back in the time of Jehu. When you were at the British Museum, I'm sure you looked at the obelisk of Shalmaneser, which is one of the most important artifacts in the British Museum, actually. Uh, and the panels uh, that go around the register up here, uh, the second register, are all panels that relate to the people of Israel, the northern nation of Israel. This is Jehu, uh, and we know that because the actual cuneiform text tells us that, and he is bowing before Shalmaneser, until finally we get to chapter 24, which is the end of the first big section of Ezekiel. And it's a pretty firmly established date, January the 15th, 588. This is when the date of Jerusalem's siege begins, this date. <clears throat> Jerusalem is like a pot, a cooking pot, ready to be cooked. We looked at that uh, Negbite crater yesterday, so he's using the same imagery here. Uh, piece by piece, the citizens of Jerusalem are going to be uh, boiled in this stew until it's boiled dry and then emptied into exile. The city will be cooked till the water is boiled away and only the remaining pieces are charred. And finally, on the night of January the 15th, 588, the beginning of the siege, Ezekiel's wife dies. How hard must this be to be a prophet? This is difficult. We, we read it and it's in a text and we can kind of just keep going on, but 
Uh, this was a real life circumstance. His wife dies. And it's interesting that it describes her uh, in such a, a, a precious way. She is the, uh, what, what is the language it uses for her? I'm sorry, I heard it two or three places, but not at the same time. Someone say it a little more loudly. Pardon? Can you find it? Yes. Uh huh. It's in verse 16. Yeah, your heart's affection, the delight of your eyes. Is that, is that the way it reads? So, so this isn't this is his wife, but this is his his, his friend. This is his his true companion, and she dies, and she dies as a symbol of the death of God's wife, who is Jerusalem. Jerusalem is symbolically portrayed as the wife of God, so as Ezekiel's wife dies, so also God's wife is going to die. You might remember that yesterday I told you, I think this illustrates it once again, that the pathos of the prophets is intended to reflect the pathos of God. Um, some of the uh, Greek philosophers used to speculate about whether God could have emotion. They felt like that if God had emotion, that would make him vulnerable. Um, and some of the early church fathers kind of played with that idea a little bit too, whether or not God could have emotion, or whether God was, uh, was emotionless, I suppose you could say. But the analogies that are used in the prophets seem to show God with great emotion, with passion, with love, with concern, with compassion. Uh, in this case, uh, the death of Jerusalem is is as wrenching for God as it was for Ezekiel's wife to die. And I think you have to understand that to really understand the nature of God's love and the nature of his compassion. Let me tell you a story, since you like stories, apparently. Um, I have a friend um, uh, who's uh, two sons, a uh, natural son and an adopted son. They're both about the same age. And uh, when they were about 18 or 19, they went hunting for squirrels. Uh, that, that's probably against the law in England, but anyway, it's, it's okay in Tennessee. Okay. <clears throat> so anyway, they had separated, and they were through the woods, and uh, the, the one son uh, thought he saw a squirrel behind a log, uh, and he was waiting for it to pop up, and when he popped up, he shot it. And when he came to get him, brother. His brother had sat with his back to a log and was, I don't know what he was doing, but when his head popped up, he shot his brother. Uh, my friend Paul, who was their father, it was the adopted son actually that shot the natural son. When, when Paul, uh, I mean they went through obviously wrenching family grief over the loss of this boy. Um, uh, and huge guilt and all, all those this type, type, type of stuff you can imagine. But Paul said that was maybe the first time he said, I understood Father sent his son. The Father sending the son to die. There is this passion of God, this anguish of God. And it was, a, it was a, an insight into the idea that God sent his son. Sometimes people would say, well, why, why would God send his son? In fact, there's, there's some crackpot American theologian that said this is, uh, this is child abuse, the idea that God would send his son, uh, which is, is stupid. Um, he said, how I would have wished that it could have been me instead of my son. If I could have traded places, I would have traded places. Uh, but he, he in, in, this, in this incident, he said he, he, he really, first, or perhaps the first time in his life, understood the insight of, of what it meant for the father. He sent his son. 
And the death of Ezekiel's wife is kind of like that. It was a wrenching experience for Ezekiel, but it's a wrenching experience for God. God has invested in the city. He's invested in these people. Years and years, he's invested in them, and they have turned from him. That's the reason Isaiah begins his book by saying, I've reared up children. They don't know me. The donkey knows his manger, but my people don't know me. Hosea says, when Israel was a child, I loved him. Out of Egypt, I called my son, and I led him, and, 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 and like, a, like a parent with a child, I taught him to walk and held him by the arms, and then when he got old enough, he abandoned me, and he left. And now you have the same kind of, of, of relational factor going on here in the book of Ezekiel. And I, I think when you, when you read those things in the prophets, you do need to understand that the pathos of the prophets is intended to reflect the pathos of God himself. This is the grief of God. The, the compassion and the, the pain of God in the loss of the city. Well, <clears throat> the death of Ezekiel's wife symbolizes not only the death of Jerusalem, but also the deaths of all those uh, relatives of the people who are now in Babylon, the people in Jerusalem that are going to die. And so uh, to symbolize the shock of this devastation, Ezekiel is forbidden to mourn the death of his wife in the usual way. He is not allowed to show emotion, not because he doesn't feel emotion, but because this is such a shocking incident. And he is to be immobilized by the shock. So the temple that God abandons is going to be defiled by strangers, and Ezekiel now is going to remain mute until a refugee would come with the news the city has fallen. I think this goes back to the question that was asked by someone, I don't remember who, about about when Ezekiel was mute, okay? I think this is probably a different circumstance than you find back in chapter 3, where he is told not to speak unless I tell you to speak. This one, it's not that he, can't, uh, that he won't speak. He can't speak. He will be mute for this period of time between the beginning of the siege and the news that the city has fallen, Ezekiel will be mute, sim similar to the father of John the Baptist. We, took to the, we looked at the siege chronology when we did Lamentations. It begins uh, on a particular day. The wall is breached on a particular day. The temple is burned on a particular day. But finally, there is this refugee that will report to the exiles that the city has fallen. Now, between chapter 24, you go through quite a few chapters before you get to chapter 33, where it actually tells you the refugee shows up. <clears throat> there is a textual discrepancy here between different ancient versions of the Bible. Um, the one in your NRSV is the middle one, which is the one that the Masoretic text has, year 12, month 10, day 5. However, <clears throat> this seems a rather unusually long period because between the actual fall of the temple in year 11, the 5th month, the 7th day, and year 12, the 10th month, the 5th day, is is uh, is is about 18 months. And so that seems a rather long time for there to be a refugee going from Babylon back to Jerusalem. because It's not that long. So <clears throat> you do find some other references to this. In the Septuagint, it says year 10, but that doesn't even make sense because in year 10 the city hasn't even fallen yet. And the refugees already showed up, so this almost everybody rejects as some kind of a transmission error um, but then there is in other Hebrew manuscripts the idea that instead of year 12, it's in year 11, which would make it about six months after the fall of the city that the refugee shows up. Um, your NRSV doesn't make any footnotes here, uh, which I kind of would have expected that it probably would have, but in any case, it doesn't. Um, uh, but in my thinking, at least, a six-month elapse is more likely the period of time uh, between the fall of the city and the refugees showing up. Uh, this is not something we can determine with any uh, precision, uh, but these do appear in the ancient texts of Ezekiel. I want to refer, refer you to Psalm 73 or 74, uh, which is one of the psalms that are, are a little bit like the book of Lamentations because it is a psalm of grief over the loss of the temple in Jerusalem. 
pick your way through these everlasting ruins, all this destruction the enemy has brought in the sanctuary. Your foes roared in the place where you met with us. They set up their standards, the signs. They behave like men wielding axes to cut through a thicket of trees. They smashed all the carved paneling with their axes and hatchets. They burned your sanctuary to the ground. They defile the dwelling place of your name. You can feel the pathos of, of, of those lines as you read them in this psalm, which, as I say, is very similar to the book of Lamentations in many ways. Now, <clears throat> let's come back to this language God gave them over in the book of Ezekiel, which is picked up by Paul in the New Testament uh, when he talks about the waywardness of humans in general. God gave them over to whatever they wanted to do. <clears throat> what do you think that language means? It's in Ezekiel, begins in Ezekiel, but it's picked up in the New Testament. What does that mean? God gives them over to certain behaviors. Yeah, I think it is. I think you're right. It's, it's, I'm going to leave them to it since they won't listen to me, and they want to go this way anyway, then I'll leave them to it. And uh, with all of the destructive repercussions and consequences that will happen because of this behavior. Yeah, I think that's the essence of it. Um, C.S. Lewis has a line in one of his books that I think is um, very much to the point. He says, there are two kinds of people in the world. Those who say to God, thy will be done. And those to whom God says, have it your way. And it's essentially what this is saying. He gives them over to do what they want to do. Um, well, his compassion is shown by his long suffering with Israel. See, he doesn't, he doesn't destroy Israel back at Sinai. He continues to work with Israel for centuries. Uh, so this is his, his compassion is his long suffering. This is what I intended, at least by that. And this is his name. His name is that he is long suffering. When, when you talk about, uh, for instance, God says he, he punishes the children of the third and fourth generation of those who hate him, but to thousands of generations to those who love him. He is slow to anger, quick to forgive, but at some point to be faithful to himself and his own covenant, he has to take action in the destruction of Jerusalem. They are recalcitrant. They are not going to turn to him. And so he, at some point, he has no choices left. He's been long-suffering century after century after century. He's been compassionate again and again, forgiven them again and again. But at some point, there's, there's no room for more. Otherwise, he will be dishonest with himself. So that's, that's the essence of what I'm trying to communicate. Yeah. Yes. Yes. It moved before it was destroyed. Well, sure. Yeah. <laughs> well, for one thing, I think you need to distinguish between omnipresence, which is God's presence everywhere, and the particular, uh, I'm not sure if I should use the word manifestation of his presence, but some special expression of his presence at particular places. Um, you find both of those as part of the biblical story. God is everywhere. But Moses on Mount Sinai is told, take off your sandals because this is holy ground. There's sacred space at various places in the Bible in which God especially uh, marks off certain places that are to be for the expression of his holiness. That doesn't conflict with the fact that he's everywhere, but it means these special places are sort of symbols of, of his holiness. Um, and I think the temple is one of those places. Um, so the glory of God has moved to Babel, and that doesn't mean God wasn't already there. He certainly was already there. The nations, all of the nations are his. But the special expression of his presence and himself has moved with the exiles to Babylon. I think that's the essential idea. Yes. 
they, uh, they, don't, they no longer have the temple. Um, they no longer have the ability to worship in temple ty type worship because there's no temple. So we're not, the, the, the origins of the synagogue are, are, are a little fuzzy, actually. We don't know exactly when they started. We, we can trace uh, some of the earliest ones back to the 3rd and 4th century BC, and they may be earlier than that. Um, uh, we're not sure, but at least at this point, there's no temple, and when the exiles come back, that is the very first thing they're going to do, is they're going to build a temple. Uh, that is absolutely priority one. Um, uh, uh, synagogues will arise later on, uh, but the temple is still central. It's this holy place. <clears throat> yeah. I didn't catch all of that. Say again. To mourn. Well, it doesn't explain it in the text of Ezekiel. It just says this is what he was supposed to do. He was supposed to be uh, in a state of uh, what, what I would call a state of shock. When a, when a person has a traumatic experience and they go into shock, what we call shock, they suddenly lose all their handles for normal life, including emotion. Uh, I don't know if you've ever been with someone who's suffered a devastating uh, sh family experience, like the loss of several members of your family all in one stroke, but they just kind of go into a, uh, a mode, I don't know what else to call it, of, of being where they, they don't feel anything, they don't see anything, they just, it's, it's a sort of a protective device, I would suppose, so that you don't completely unravel and go nuts. Um, so I'm, I'm thinking that's at least what the point is here of Ezekiel. But it's especially for the exilic people that surround Ezekiel to see him. They will expect him to mourn his wife. And the fact that he is in shock is supposed to call attention to the fact that this is not an ordinary death. <clears throat> this is a death that has meaning beyond just Ezekiel and himself. So I'm, I'm assuming that at least that's part of it, that, that they're supposed to see beyond just his family circumstance and see this as a symbol for the death of Jerusalem itself. Yeah. Sure. <clears throat> yeah. That's right. Yes. Yes. <clears throat> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think so. I think it's very much like that. When she finally gives birth to this little baby, she says, she names him, again, going back to names, the glory is gone. Uh, Ichabod. Yeah. And I think it's very much like that. Okay. 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 Um, let's see. I've got what ten minutes? I think I can do what I want to do in ten minutes. I'm not going to spend much time with the oracles to the nations, other than to say that among all of the prophets, there will be oracles to the nations outside of Judah and Israel. <clears throat> this is because Yahweh is not a provincial god. He's not a local God. He's the God of everything, God of everyone. And so it's therefore important that he has something to say to the surrounding nations. So you find substantial portions of Amos, Isaiah, Micah, Joel, Zephaniah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel. All of these uh, books in the Old Testament have substantial sections which are about nations other than Israel and Judah. And in Ezekiel, the nations are going to be judged with respect to how they treated Jerusalem and Israel. And coming in for a special censure is going to be the Edomites. So there are seven oracles to the nations, Ammon, Moab, Edom, Philistia in chapter 25, uh, Tyre and Sidon in verse, uh, chapters uh, uh, 26 through 28, which is Phoenicia, and then Egypt in seven oracles. Uh, and probably the number seven here takes on some symbolic value of completeness. 
or fullness, similar to the book of Revelation. Um, these are the various nations we're talking about that surround uh, the nation of Judah. But then there is one that has gotten a lot of attention, so I need to spend a little bit of time with this one. This is the one about the king of Tyre, uh, who is Ithabal II. We, uh, we know his name, we know something of his career from ancient history. And <clears throat> I want you to turn to chapter 28 in your NRSV, because there's a really, 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 really important translation issue. Okay? <clears throat> if you go to chapter 28, um, there is this oracle about the king of Tyre uh, and the city of Tyre and so on. Uh, and so in this oracle about the king of Tyre, when you get down to, uh, or when you begin in chapter 28, it's going to say to the prince of Tyre, this will be the ruler. But when you get down to verse 14, you have this passage that says, with an anointed cherub as guardian, I placed you, and I placed you in Eden. Now, <clears throat> this is the translation issue. Critical language is this language, cherub. In, it appears a couple of times in the passage, but this is the, the one that's most important. In the Masoretic text, by the way, have, have I talked enough about the Masoretic text? Do you know what I mean talking about? Maybe I better talk about that first. Okay. <clears throat> um, in the text of the Old Testament that we translate into whatever language, we usually begin with what is called the Masoretic text. The Masoretic text is the Hebrew text that was preserved by Jewish scholars called the Masoretes. And it is a pointed text, which in around the 9th century they added vowel pointing to, and today is represented by what is called the Leningrad Codex, um, uh, which is what scholars use to translate uh, the Old Testament. So this is the ancient Hebrew text. <clears throat> However, it isn't the only text from the ancient period. And the text that we have is only about a little over a thousand years old. <coughs> Excuse me. One reason is that Hebrew texts are used in the synagogue and they're, they're actually used. They're not sitting on the shelf. So when you use a text, eventually what happens? It wears out. And so you copy it and you make a new text. And you respectfully bury the old text in what is called a Geniza, uh, which is a special burial place for texts, usually a hidden place. Occasionally we run into one of those uh, accidentally, usually because they're not, we don't know where they are. They're, they're just, uh, they're just you know, taken care of in a very uh, respectful way. The Masoretic text, therefore, while it probably represents a Hebrew text that goes back hundreds of years earlier than that, the actual text is only a little over a thousand years old. <clears throat> Alongside that, then, we also have the Septuagint, which is a translation of Hebrew into Greek, but even though it is in a second language, it is much older than the Masoretic text. So we have this odd thing that our oldest text in Hebrew, physically at least, is not nearly as old as our translation in Greek. Okay? So sometimes scholars are going to be comparing text from this text to this text. This text is Hebrew, but this text is older even though it's in Greek. Everybody with me so far? Okay. Now you're going to add uh, some other text. You've got like the Dead Sea Scrolls. Uh, and you have other Hebrew texts that have come to light besides the Masoretic text and so on. So, when you come back to this passage in verse 14, the NRSV is going to translate this as the anointed cherub who is a guardian I placed you. However, in the Septuagint, the, or I'm sorry, in the, I said this incorrectly, I'm sorry, where it says, the, um, where am I at here? Uh, do you see the end, the little end footnote in verse 14? And you go down to the bottom of the page, and what does it say? The meaning of the Hebrew is uncertain. Okay? So they have translated it that the cherub is in the garden, but is not the king. 
But in the Masoretic text, the way it reads is that the king of Tyre is the cherub. And that makes a lot of difference for interpretation because this is where you get the idea. Oops, don't want to go there yet. This is where you get the idea that this passage about the king of Tyre is really about the devil. Okay? The fall of Satan. Yes. And it's because of this word cherub that is not in, in, in the Masoretic text, is not alongside the king of Tyre, but is the king of Tyre. Okay, so in any case, um, you'll find two different approaches to translating this passage in the English versions. So the one that you are using, the NRSV, is going to be similar to the RSV, the New English Bible, the New American Bible, which is a Roman Catholic translation. But the alternative is going to be found in the King James Version, the New International Version, the New American Standard Bible, and I didn't put it there, but also the English Standard Version. So in SBSs, they tend to use this one or the ESV, and they divide on this issue. Was the king of Tyra really a symbol of the devil? Well, I'm not so sure. Uh, I think it's, in my opinion, I think it's unlikely. Um, but it is a translation issue, uh, and at least you should be aware of it. Um, if you hear somebody bearing down real heavy on this idea that the king of Tyre is the devil, I think a, a red flag should go up and say, uh, maybe not. <laughs> okay? Uh, it's not a certainty by any means. Uh, and I wouldn't put a lot of weight on trying to make this the fall of Satan. I've even heard people preach that the devil was the worship leader of heaven and all these things were about the instruments of heaven. I don't know if you want to know my opinion about that, but I think it's bull crap. Um, that's, a, that's a biblical word, by the way. Um, <laughs> doesn't appear very often. I think it is a comparison of the king of Tyre who is self-exalted. He has made him, he is so narcissistic he is so uh, lifted up with his own pride and his own ego that he's uh, sort of like a cherub. Uh, and he's like uh, the, the first primal creature in the Garden of Eden. It's an analogy uh, rather than a direct description. So I, I, you don't have to necessarily agree with me on that, but at least you do need to know about the translation issue uh, because it is, a, it is an important issue here.